welcome back from the break and hopefully from uh, a lunchtime if you did manage to grab some food. Uh, if you want to stay here for parallel session 3A, it'll be in this section, this session here, chaired by myself. Alternatively, if you're looking for session 3B, so that's long-term trends and structural dynamics, that session is in a, a separate call. So uh, Gillian uh, has put the link in the uh, chat bar. So if you're looking for session 3B, follow the other link. Otherwise, we're heading into session 3A here, looking at mobility and transitions. In which case, uh, welcome back, everybody. So heading into this next section, we have uh, three speakers with three very interesting papers coming up. So I'll, I'll start off by introducing our first speaker in this section. So it'll be Xavier Saint-Denis, who is an assistant professor at the Institut National de la Recherche Scientifique in Montreal in Canada. His research explores the drivers of trends in job stability in OECD countries, the consequences of career instability, and on intragenerational income mobility, obviously with a focus in Canada. His research appears in the British Journal of Industrial Relations, Work, Employment and Society, the International Labour Review, and the Canadian Review of Sociology as well. So here today, he'll be telling us about how he's been using the five-quarter longitudinal LFS data sets to investigate demographic characteristics of people moving between occupations and potential obstacles in doing so. You can see the slides are there. So, Xavier, over to you. Um, well, hello, everybody, and uh, thank you so much, James, for this introduction. Um, so I'm really thrilled to be here to present a paper uh, co-authored with uh, Edward Haddon, who is a postdoctoral fellow uh, at uh, INRS. Um, okay. Um, so um, this paper uh, uh, is interested in um, the in contributing to the, the, the debate on um, occupational transitions as they occur, um, or you know, the motivation is that uh, we're expecting to see high rates of occupational transitions in times of recession or economic uh, or restructuring um, that occur. Um, so for example, during the COVID pandemic, we've seen a lot of discussions about uh, workers leaving certain sectors that were shut down uh, for uh, to, 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 to find jobs in new occupations and sectors that were not shut down or that were growing in size. And likewise, in times, times of technological change uh, or when there's a recession uh, leading to uh, a shrinkage in the size of a, a given sector, such as the manufacturing sector, uh, workers, many workers are faced with um, uh, the need to uh, find uh, a job in a new, new occupation that they're not necessarily skilled for, that they're not necessarily prepared for. for. So um, this debate on uh, occupational mobility um, has, um, at least in some policy circles, uh, has focused on uh, the issue of the mismatch between the skills uh, workers have and uh, the skills uh, required for uh, occupations that are uh, looking for workers. Uh, so in a Canadian context, uh, we currently have a uh, 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 pretty intense uh, public policy discussion on how to deal with, uh, with this issue and with the issue of worker or skill shortages on the labor market. Um, and so um, large um, uh, publicly funded programs have emerged focusing on retraining, reskilling. Um, and this has led, uh, not just in Canada, uh, the, to the development of some tools, um, uh, uh, of some tools to identify the least uh, costly uh, uh, occupational transition pathways um, with, with tools such as one developed by the World Economic Forum, uh, trying to identify um, occupations that are most, uh, pairs of occupations that are the most skill similar um, and uh, that have only small differences in wages. Uh, so these occupations would be, uh, these pairs of occupations would be occupations between which it is um, easy to transition uh, because it would require uh, only limited reskilling and uh, would lead to, um, uh, would allow workers to, to, to keep similar wages when they uh, undergo this transition. Um, so the contribution of the paper I'm presenting today, uh, what I'm seeking to do is to try to broaden a little bit that perspective to include other, uh, obstacles other than skills that workers may face uh, when trying to uh, change occupations. Um, and so I'm gonna draw on various literatures, um, but for, so for example, the literature in sociology, um, uh, there's a rich literature uh, identifying uh, 
what what sociologists call class related obstacles, which is mostly um, occupation specific professional networks, uh, social and cultural capital that facilitate transition between certain occupations. Um, uh, 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 that are um, part of larger class groupings, for example. Um, there's also a possible role uh, that's been documented in the, in the literature, of, of, of course, uh, uh, for discrimination or labor market segregation based on gender and race, etc., uh, that may make it hard for workers to transition between two skills similar occupations, um, but that may have different uh, gender compositions, for example. Um, and finally, there are social closure dynamics based on it, uh, uh, the over-credentialization of certain occupations, uh, licensing and certific certification requirements uh, necessary for entry in certain occupations that restrict the number of workers that uh, uh, can enter an occupation. Um, and so, uh, in short, the, the objective of this paper is to develop measures capturing a broad range of obstacles that, that workers may face when they seek to change occupations beyond, uh, beyond skills. Uh, so to provide basic, basically a multidimensional look at obstacles to occupational mobility. Um, and so in this paper, we provide a descriptive analysis of occupational transition flows and uh, a, a broad set of, of, drive, uh, of possible drivers. Uh, of occupational transitions. Uh, and so just in short, we ask what are what factors structure occupational mobility and what may be the role of factors that are more rarely studied. Um, so that's all I'm gonna say uh, for in terms of, uh, of context. And I'm gonna ju jump right into the, 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 the data part of the presentation. Um, so uh, when we study occupations with statist statistical data, as most of you know, um, we uh, usually rely on uh, standard occupational classifications uh, such as the UK uh, SOC uh, uh, classification. So here for this presentation, uh, we're using uh, SOC 2010. Um, and the basic principle here behind the development of such classifications is that um, a job is uh, um, defined as a set of tasks or duties carried, carried out by one person. So a job is a bun uh, 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 jobs become occupations uh, and or, or different jobs are part of the same occupation if uh, uh, they they bundle a set of tasks or duties or no, uh, knowledge uh, similarly uh, similarly and so um, in the UK uh, SOC documentation uh, or, or uh, classification jobs are classified based on um, skill levels and the types of skills that are used. Um, with skill level being um, related to the, the 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 level of education, training, and experience require uh, that 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 occupational incumbents usually have, and uh, the skill spe specialization or type of knowledge uh, more related to the kind of knowledge that are used at work and the kind of tasks that are performed at work. Um, as so again, as most of you know, uh, there are nine major groups in the uh, UK uh, SOC classification, and these are broken down into. Uh, uh, Sub-major groups uh, at the, the two-digit level, minor groups at the three-digit level, and then unit groups, which is the most detailed uh, uh, level of the classification, at the four-digit level. And there are 369 units in the SOC 10. Um, so uh, these, the, each of these uh, occupational categories are associated with a textual description. Um, and so uh, the, issue, the issue that we're trying to address today is that uh, when using this classification, this hierarchical classification, um, it's not always obvious to um, to determine uh, how dissimilar two occupations are. For example, um, uh, there's no, or, and I'm, I'm simplifying a little bit, but there's no straightforward way uh, without using, um, uh, without relying on, on the text um, uh, to quantify, for example, whether to uh, a move between uh, uh, chemical scientists and biochemists, so from the 2111 uh, unit group and 2112 unit group, is uh, 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 a move between two occupations that are more similar than um, a move between 2011, uh, 2111 and, for example, 2114, social and human scientists. So with our knowledge, reading, reading the text, we, we know that, that chemical scientists are more similar to biochemists than social scientists, um, but uh, uh, it's, it's not as straightforward to quantify that. Um, and so what that means is, uh, if we want to think about, um, uh, in this case, uh, in, in this framework, uh, occupations are discrete categories. Um, and uh, when we want to think about a, the, the 
how different those occupations are, where the distance between them, um, we have to think about it in a binary way, in or out, so the same or different. Uh, and so, for, for example, if uh, a worker was to transition between um, the fourth major group, administrative and secretarial occupation, uh, to another occupation in the same major group, we would say that uh, they're transitioning to a similar occupation. But uh, if they're transitioning from the fifth major, major group to the fourth major group, or uh, seventh major group to the the, the, the fourth major group again, uh, it's hard to say which worker um, uh, 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 transition or which type of transition uh, uh, has the most obstacles uh, involved. Um, in contrast, um, in this paper, we try to adopt a multi-dimensional view of occupations, uh, looking at a broad range of different characteristics that we uh, quantify on continuous scales. Um, where, where we would be able to, uh, to, to quantify whether a move from uh, the seventh to the fourth major group uh, spans a, uh, or, or, or involves a, 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 greater num a, a, a greater number of obstacles than a transition from the fifth to the fourth uh, major group, for example. Um, so uh, in order to be, to be able to do that, we need, uh, we need a few things. Um, so we need uh, first a data source uh, that is longitudinal that captures, uh, that measures occupations at two, two time points uh, for a representative sample of adults. Um, and uh, so the UK Labour Force Survey and I'll, uh, uh, pr provides that information. I'll say a little bit more about that in the next slide. But we also need a data set of occupational characteristics to calculate uh, distance indices. So, so, so measures of distance between uh, various occupations. Uh, for multiple dimensions of occupational skills and composition. Uh, and to do so, we, um, we use the uh, ONET that we map onto the SOC uh, 2010 uh, uh, classification and uh, data from the UK LFS again on uh, occupational composition. So um, again, the UK Labour Force Survey, as you, you, you probably all know, is a representative sa sample of a, the adult population. It's a large, uh, quite large data set uh, with a lot of information on worker characteristics and their jobs. Um, one feature that we leverage in this paper is that it, it's, uh, it's, uh, its sampling design uses rotation groups, which means that every respondent stays in the survey or, or ex is expected to stay in the survey for five quarters, uh, which makes the LFS longitudinal. Um, and so we can observe any occupational change that occurs within this window of five quarters. Now, the ONET, um, some of you may know this data set. Um, uh, so this data set basically includes um, a large number of uh, indicators on the work activities, knowledge, skills, activities uh, performed in each detailed uh, occupations from the US SOC classification. Uh, so it's collected from occupational experts and occupational incumbents. And um, uh, the, so the, 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 the part of the data set that we use is uh, the 41 indicators under the work activities or tasks uh, 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 data set. So um, how this data set is created is uh, it's an aggregation of information on hundreds of detailed tasks that are performed uh, by workers in different occupations that are classified in, as I said, 41 different indicators. Uh, one example is, for example, is, uh, you know, inspecting equipment, structures, or materials, uh, et cetera. So it's, it's work activities or tasks, but there's also physical tasks uh, as well. Um, and so this is what it looks like. Basically, uh, every indicator has two scales that we multiply to create a single scale for, for, for a given indicator, importance multiplied by level. Um, and as an example, it reveals some similarities between occupations that wouldn't be uh, captured by a hierarchical uh, framework, uh, such as the major, sub major, sub major, minor, and unit groups. Uh, so sociologists here uh, estimate quantifiable characteristics of products, events, or information uh, in a similar way or with a similar uh, using a similar level uh, as urologists, boilermakers, etc. So it reveals some similarities, but of course those occupations are different uh, under other dimensions. And so what we're doing with the ONET is that we're um, conducting a principal component an component an analysis on 41 ONET work activities indicators. Um, uh, where we, we basically extract eight principal components and um, develop a single distance measure or calculate the single distance measure based on th these principal components uh, using a, uh, a Euclidean uh, distance. Um, and so what th th this gives us is a 
killed the similarity score between all all three sixty nine by three sixty nine pairs of occupations uh, in order to to quantify the 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 the, the skill the similarity between all possible pair of occupations in the UK stock. Uh, we do the same with the differences in socio-demographic composition. Um, and so we calculate the proportion of workers with uh, various uh, uh, characteristics um, in the, um, in the, uh, uh, from the uh, UK LFS again, pulling a few cross sections together. So, so share of workers with uh, graduate degrees, share of women, share of racialized workers in each occupations. And then we calculate the absolute value, the difference in those proportions between all possible pairs of occupations again. Uh, and so we estimate the log linear model um, without going too much into de details. Um, the, the, the dependent variable is the log of the uh, frequency count of um, uh, uh, the number of workers who are in a given uh, cell in our data set, which is a data set aggregated at the, the, the level of uh, pairs of occupations. And so we know how many workers uh, in uh, uh, each line is a pair of occupations with a number of workers who uh, underwent this transition over five quarters. Um, and so we have a parameter for skill dissimilarity and we have three parameters for a uh, uh, difference in sociodemographic composition. Um, so here are qu very quickly our distributions for the distance measures. Uh, they're all standardized in the model that I'm going to present after. Um, and they're not not very correlated. So it's likely that we'll, they, they may have independent effects. Um, so only in a descriptive way, this is the, this is basically the, all, all, all the transitions that we observe. Um, and so the large um, the large points uh, on the, 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 the small diagonal, uh, are all workers who stayed in um, in the same occupation at time one and time two at the, in the same unit group, um, and then uh, dots that are in the same uh, similarly colored squares are workers who changed occupations, uh, changed unit groups, but stayed in the same major group. So we see that a lot of workers uh, um, uh, uh, transition between two occupations that are in the same major group. But what we see then in gray is all, all, all kinds, of, kinds, of, kinds of transitions where workers left their major groups. Um, so it seems like it's fairly frequent. Uh, that there are certain locations uh, in the, this occupational transition matrix uh, where uh, tra transitions are, 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 are quite likely and frequent. Um, and so basically we wanna know if these, um, uh, if these transitions are, uh, are are driven by um, uh, the uh, the similarity between uh, uh, those occupations, even if they're not in the same major group, for example. Um, so the estimates of our log linear model um, uh, are presented in this table, and I want to focus on model eight, which includes all of our distance measures plus our our, our, our big class or uh, occupational major group and marker class, uh, so occupational minor groups uh, dummies. So these coefficients, when they're below one, it means that uh, an increase in one standard deviation in a distance measure is, is associated with decrease in the rate of transition between a pair of occupations. Um, and so we see that uh, as the, the, the distance and skill similarity in education share and sex share and ethnicity share increases in all cases, it uh, decreases the rate of transition between, uh, uh, between, between those occupations. So occupations that are more dissimilar along those four dimensions um, uh, have fewer uh, fewer workers transitioning between them, um, and so this broadly supports our our, our, our hypothesis that um, uh, there, there's going to be beyond be, beyond skill dissimilarity. Uh, there are other factors uh, that or other obstacles faced by workers who uh, seek to transition between occupations, and and, it's, um, and so I will uh, jump to my concluding slide now. Um, so so just. From, so just uh, restating the point that uh, the factors that structure occupational mobility flows, uh, occupational flows are, are really multiple. Um, and in this paper, there are some important limitations to note, which is that we still take a limited number of dimensions into account. Um, and so we don't really take in, we haven't taken in this version of the paper into account uh, uh, the geographic concentration of occupations, uh, differences in compensation or certification and licensing requirements. There may be other dimensions. And if you have ideas, I'd be interested to hear them. We haven't taken also the, into account the direction of the distance. Uh, so uh, move, or the move towards 
uh, more skill intensive or less skill intensive occupations or between more feminized or less feminized occupations. And finally, uh, we haven't really explored the difference between personal and occupational characteristics. Uh, so this would need to be modeled in a slightly different way. Uh, and so just to, to open on a discussion point, um, I think this paper points at um, the need to, to think about uh, a broad range of uh, possibly ex exclusionary factors uh, that may represent significant obstacles to certain occupational transitions when we uh, think about the development of interventions and policies focused on uh, uh, facilitating occupational mobility. Uh, so thank you, and I look forward, forward to your comments and questions. Uh, moving on to the next uh, section. So uh, bear in mind that there's a lot of chat in the chat of I know, but there is parallel session 3B if you wanted the other presentation going on. However, if you're still staying here, we're moving on to uh, Fabian Petit, who is a research fellow at the Science Policy Research Unit at the University of Sussex, and is also part of the Horizon 2020 Pillars Project. He's interested in labor economics, macroeconomics, and behavioral economics, with his research focused on labor markets, technology skills, and intergenerational mechanisms. Today, we're gonna to hear about an investigation into the topic of social mobility and the ability for people to proverbially climb the ladder and develop their careers through middling jobs up towards high paying occupations. So Fabien, over to you. Um, today, um, talk is about um, social mobility and the basic link uh, that it could have with uh, job polarization. So um, this is a joint work with uh, Cecilia garcia Penaloza and Tanguy Van Ipersel from uh, Exmarsi School of uh, Economics. Um, and the question we ask is basically whether individuals can still climb the social ladder as the middling jobs are becoming scarce. Um, and we use uh, British core studies to answer this question. So there has been a decline in social mobility over the past decade. Uh, this has been observed for the UK, but also for the US. And therefore this has strengthened the link uh, between individuals background and also their socioeconomic outcomes. Uh, so such as like the occupation that you could get. Uh, the, the second point is that uh, there has been um, a phenomenon that is the job polarization that has been observed. Um, and this phenomenon has been observed in many um, uh, developed or in developed countries. Um, so basically the job polarization process is the idea that if you split occupations into three groups, the low paying occupations, the middling and the high paying occupations, the employment uh, creation is done at the extreme of the distribution. And so those jobs in the middle, they tend to disappear. The intuition behind that is that those jobs are routine jobs uh, and therefore they are automatized and they are fewer jobs uh, available here. And so if you used to be in a world where you can start at the bottom and you can climb the, ladder, the social ladder to end up in high paying occupation, but those jobs are disappearing in the middle, then you might get stuck at the bottom. And so that is basically the kind of question that we answer um, in, this, um, in this paper. So to answer to this question, we use those two metro British core studies. So one is born in 58, this is the NCDS. One in born in 70, this is the British uh, core study, the BCS. And so we exploit the fact that one cohort, um, the, the younger one, uh, entered on the labor market, which was much more polarized compared to the older cohort. So we proceed in two steps. So um, today I will mostly focus on the second one, which is the, the one that we, we improved recently. Um, and I will just go through the first one. So. Our empirical strategy goes this way. So we disentangle first the changes in social mobility that are due to what we call the intragenerational component. So it's the job to job transition. So basically what Xavier was uh, presenting uh, in the previous presentation. So all people move from one occupation to the other and we will focus on the first period occupation. So when they are young and their mature occupation when they are 42, for instance. And so we will focus on this mechanism and we will have another component that will be the intergenerational component. So the role of family background, for instance, the role of parental income in explaining the transition and the social mobility of their children. So we'll, we'll play with those two components. Then we will also go at the regional level and we, we will estimate the uh, effect of polarization on the role of parental income so basically, if you are born in a region in which the, there has been a polarization, you will find that uh, the role of parental income, income has increased and uh, this has basically um, increased the immobility um, in that region. So in terms of the main results, um, there are three of those. So first of all, uh, we show that this intragenerational comp component, so the mobility that you get from one job to the other, is very important in explaining the intergenerational mobility. We also find that those uh, 
from better off backgrounds, so those from the top of the parental income distribution, they are more they have been more likely in the younger cohort to climb the social ladder compared uh, to the older cohort. So um, the role of parental background has re been reinforced um, from one cohort to the other. And lastly, uh, based on regional studies, um, we show that the effect of parental income on occupation uh, on occupational outcomes is stronger in the in the areas with greater job polarization. Um, so that is for the main result. In terms of related literatures, um, so we contribute to the literature on the determinants of intergenerational mobility. And here, mostly we show that this intragenerational component, so the, the job that you get as a first occupation and all the transition going on after that are very important in explaining the intergenerational mobility when you look at the effect of parental income on uh, children outcome. So that is our contribution to this literature. Uh, we also contribute on showing that there is an increased role uh, on showing that the role of parental background has increased on children outcomes. Um, and so here we get rid of the mechanism of education and we still find that parental income has an effect on the transition afterwards. Um, lastly, and more importantly, the consequences of employment polarization. There is a literature about that with several consequences. Um, we basically show that actually employment polarization has also an effect on polarization. And the closest papers uh, to ours are basically Enning and Google, in which they argue that the polarization has generated the polarization in education, which reinforces um, the, the lack of mobility. Uh, the thing is that their explanation works pretty well for um, uh, the US, uh, for instance, where education costs are very high. But it, this cannot be applied to European countries. And with our paper, we get a story based on basically the transitions from job to job that uh, could apply for countries such as uh, the UK or uh, any other European countries. So let's dig into the, um, the data. Um, so we have those two Metro British core studies. So one is the BCS. So they are born in uh, 1970. The other one is born in 58. And we'll focus on two periods. So their entry job, their first period occupation. So for the younger cohort, this will be 26. For the older, this will be 23. And we'll look at the outcome when they are uh, 42. And we'll look at the transition between this first period and the second period, but also at the first period occupation and the second period occupation. We will measure the average parental income as a proxy for uh, basically the parental uh, background. And uh, we will get this parental income from underage interviews. Um, we will look at this variable in logarithm, and then we will standardize at the cohort level. The intuition for that is that because there has been a rise in inequality, um, the variance of the distribution of parental income has increased from one cohort to the, to the other. So we want to get rid of this effect, and so we standardize it. In terms of occupations, we will regroup occupations. So here uh, we have UK data, so we have the, the social... Uh, uh, the stock classification, uh, we use a crosswalk to get the ISCO 88 occupations, and we classify according to the literature on job polarization into three categories, plus an out of work category for people not being, yeah, not working, basically. So here you have the occupations, and we end up with those four types of jobs. So in terms of the empirical approach for the first part, basically, we estimate multinom multinomial logistic regression. So for the first period occupation, for the mature occupation, and then here we look at the transition. So once you get this first period occupation J, how do you transit to occupation K? Or it might be that this is the same type of occupation and you, you stay uh, in the same occupation. All the long, uh, for each uh, regression, basically we will have the effect of parental uh, background and a set of uh, control variables. And we will interact uh, all variables with a dummy that you, that equals what for the younger cohort. And basically by looking at the coefficient interacting with the dummy, we get the change from one cohort to the other in terms of the role of parental income. So I'm gonna uh, go a bit fast on that, but basically what you observe here is that if you are at the top of the parental income distribution, basically the likelihood that you start in a high paying occupation has increased. Whereas if you are at the bottom for male and female, this hasn't changed. It's the same picture uh, with the second period occupation. So when individuals are 42, um, and so you see that basically people along the parental income distribution do not have the same change, change, chances to end up in different uh, occupations. And this has worsened uh, over time, or at least for those two courts. So 
Uh, I'm going to skip on the transition and I will go at the regional level directly. Um, so here what we do is that we use the label for survey uh, to build a polarization measure that we'll explain in, in just a, a, few, a few minutes. Uh, we have those two 10 regions, we have those uh, 10 regions, um, which are nuts, um, nuts, um, nuts two regions. Um, and so what we are interested in is the, the, the change in the role of parental income between one cohort and the other. So this will be measured by the coefficients beta here. So this is for the younger cohort, this is for the uh, older cohort, and we'll take the difference in the role of parental background uh, to explain the occupation K uh, at the age of 42. And we will get this estimation at the regional level. So we'll get basically a change in the role of parental income for each region in the UK. And what we, are interested in, which, what we are interested in is the link between this regional polarization, this measure that we, I will explain in a minute, and the role of parental income. And so we will run thereafter this regression on which we try to look at the effect of this change in polarization on uh, the change in the role of parental background. Um, we have a set of control here. I won't spend much time on it, but they make sense in some whole. Um, the problem with this relationship is that you have to concern, you have the endogeneity issues. So basically the regional structure of employment may have also been affected by the degree of social mobility and you have a nominated viable bias that is possible. So other factors may have affected both polarization and social mobility. So the strategy regarding this is to use a shift share measure that is based on national level changes. So basically we look at the change at the national level in two, between 2004 and 1992, which is basically the middle of the career uh, of the younger cohorts and the middle of the career of the older cohorts. And we use uh, the share. So it's pretty standard in the ship share literature. Um, that, and in, so the share was before um, the period. So at this point, the polarization process was not much going on. And so we can basically get rid of the endogeneity issue. And then we instrument uh, those share here with uh, basically the change in the occupations, but average across a set of European countries. Um, and so this is consistent also with the literature and because we know that this polarization process has taken place in uh, several uh, European countries. And so by doing so, basically, we get a shift share IV strategy and getting directly to the result, what we observe is that basically in the regions in which the change in employment polarization has been large, we also observe that the change in the parental income coefficient uh, for the second period occupation uh, has also been large. So there is a positive correlation between employment polarization at the regional level and the change in the role of parental income uh, in those regions. So um, I want to keep spare a bit of time for questions. So in terms of insight that we can derive from this paper, uh, basically, we show that the intragenerational mobility is an essential aspect of the observed correlation between parents and child outcomes. Um, in, we also show that basically those from better home backgrounds, so at the top of the parental income distribution, they have become more likely to climb the job ladder. And those who are at the bottom, they are more likely to get stuck at the bottom of the, 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 the income distribution because they, will, they are more likely to get jobs uh, which are low paid. Um, and lastly, the, at the regional level, um, basically we show that the areas in which uh, the polarization was important, was greater, uh, are also the, the regions in which the role of parental income has played, uh, has become more important. So thank you for your attention. Uh, if you have any question, I would be more than happy to, uh, to answer. Um, and you can always reach me by uh, my email um, and you can find the, uh, the draft of the paper on my website. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Fabian. Uh, there's nothing in the QA box at the moment. So if anyone has any questions, please put them in. Uh, I'll ask a question myself if that's all right. So when we're thinking about the parental income, uh, how exactly is, is that defined? Is that the main earner or the total of a couple or the whole household income? How about is that you've broken down into just the single variable? Yes, good question, James. Thank you. Um, so, so what we do here is um, similar to what is done in the literature regarding uh, parental income uh, when they look at uh, income or social mobility. So basically the papers of Blendon, Macmillan and co-authors. Um, so here 
we look at the parental income in underage interviews and we use um, the household income uh, as a measure. Um, so for instance, in the case of the, um, the BCS, this income is, is available at uh, year 10 and 16. So we think basically the average. Uh, and here yeah, for the, the older court, unfortunately, it's only available at the age of 16. Of course, we, we, we run several robust net shape uh, to show that uh, this is not what is driving the, the effect. And that's whole household income. So it, it might be factoring in, say, a grandparent who happened to live there or an, an older child's part of the family as well. Um, sorry, what, what? So that the parental income there you're saying is the household income. So yes. if there are other workers in the household beyond just the parent or two parents, that might be factored into that total as well. Um, that's a good point, indeed. Um, so here, yes, here we, we, we do not have this. Um, we do not have this. I agree that this would uh, matter, especially because we could think that there would be also a channel for which like having the grandparents around could help uh, in building um, the future of the, the children. Yes, I agree. Uh, it's, a, it's a good point. That I think we should uh, look at it. Um, thank you. Sorry, I've instigated more work, but hopefully a useful thought. Uh, we have another question here as well from Christina. So uh, could patterns you found in the second cohort at age 42 have been influenced by the economic crisis that was happening at the time? Yes. Um, so, okay. So very good point also. Um, so what we, yeah, so there are two things. Um, we have checked, uh, I don't know if it's here in the appendix because I, I made a very slight, uh, short presentation, but uh, this is important. Um, so there have been several crises over this timeline um, in the 90s also. Um, so what we do is that actually we have the full activity history. Uh, the reason why we pick up those uh, specific years is because there are interviews at those years, and therefore uh, the occupations that are reported that are reported during those uh, interviews are more precise. But if we want, we can basically pick any year in between, uh, but this won't be as accurate. So what we have done is that we have checked basically with respect to the business cycles um, and uh, and the crisis if this was not driven by all the crises that happen over all those um all this timeline and we find that basically uh the results are pretty robust to this uh 2008 crisis although um this might um also be part of the story but there is something that is more about long term but thank you for your question christina hey okay. i don't think there are any other questions at the moment in which case uh, thank you very much, Fabian. We're almost back on time. Fantastic. So I appreciate the presentation. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, in which case, we'll head on to the third of our three presentations in this particular parallel session. So moving over to uh, Marie. Marie Horton is a senior research analyst at Engineering UK, which is a nonprofit organization working with the engineering community to increase the knowledge and interest uh, in engineering careers among young people. Recent reports by Engineering UK have published uh, looking at uh, options in uh, opinions in, on engineering, as well as educational pathways into engineering and the workforce itself, which have been used to inform educational providers, employers, and policymakers. Specifically today, she'll be presenting her review of the representation of female workers in the engineering workforce and the effects of uh, recent efforts to attract more female workers into the, the profession. So Marie, hopefully you're there, ready to go. Yeah, um, can you see my slides okay? Yep, slides and we can hear you. Go for it, Great. thank you. Okay, so um, yeah, as James said, I'm going to talk through some work we published in the last year on the trends in the numbers and percentages of women in the engineering workforce. So to start a bit about um, Engineering UK, um, so we're a not-for-profit not organisation and we work in partnership with the engineering community. Um, we do this with our programmes such as Energy Quest, Robotics Challenge and the Big Bang Fair. And they're designed to excite young people about the variety and opportunity presented by a career in modern engineering. We try to give them the chance to meet people already working as engineers. Um, so I work in the research team and as well as analysing survey data gathered from young people, part of my role is to explore the data on the engineering workforce. And to do this, we use the Labour Force survey and we explore all different insights that we can gain. So last year, I did a deep dive into the trends in female engineers 
because we know that although engineering remains a male dominated field, since 2010, we've seen both a proportional and absolute increase in the number of women working in engineering. And we wanted to explore if there are particular roles um, within engineering where we've seen these increases, where they've been concentrated, or perhaps some parts of engineering that haven't seen um, a, as much increase or where the numbers of women have decreased. So um, <clears throat> the analysis we've carried out looks at various aspects of what we call the engineering footprint. I'm just going to talk you through this diagram here to make it clearer what I'm referring to throughout the rest of the presentation. Um, and the way we um, define this is using the SOC codes that some other people have already talked about. So I won't go into too much detail about what SOC codes are. <clears throat> Firstly, the centre circle here, we have the core engineering occupations. So these are roles that are primarily engineering based and require consistent application of engineering knowledge and skills to execute the role effectively. So, for example, this might be civil engineers, mechanical engineers and technician. But also part of the engineering footprint, we have what we call related engineering careers, and that's represented here in the outer circle. So these are roles that require a mixed application of engineering knowledge and skills alongside other skill sets that are often of greater importance to executing the role. So for example, that might be quantity surveyors, architects, IT operations technicians, web designers and developers. And then for both uh, core and related engineering occupations, we can categorize them by industry, which we would do using the SIP codes. Um, so they could either be in the engineering industry, which might be, for example, a manufacturing or construction company, but there are also engineers that work outside of the engineering industry. So that might be, for example, in retail. Um, and this is important in the context of this work because we know that there are more women working in areas outside of core engineering and also outside of the engineering industry than there are in the core occupations within the engineering industry. So it's important for us to try and understand why. Now, uh, before we start to look at the results, I just want to briefly cover the way the data set was prepared. So for each of the data points calculated, um, we took four quarters of the LFS quarterly um, data set from the UK Data Archive, and we collated them to create an annual data set. Um, and then we took only waves one and five of the data so that we weren't uh, double counting any respondents who would have appeared in more than one quarter of the data, um, but in different waves. Um, and then also just to uh, reiterate what Martina was saying earlier um, about um, the mode change um, over the time period. So when we're looking at um, the trends, we know that um, the mode change from mainly face to face to uh, telephone data collection, and that might have had an effect on the sample demographics. Um, so we just need to take that into account when we're looking at the trends. Okay, so moving on to the data, this chart is showing the trends in women from 2010 to 2021. So the yellow line at the top of the chart shows all occupations, and the gray line shows core and related engineering combined. So obviously starting with the good news there, we can see there's an increase in the engineering occupations from 10.5% in 2010 to 16.5% um, in 2021. However, we're still a long way off the 47.7% average for all occupations. Um, so that's remained quite stable over the entire period um, and engineering has not seen uh, much of an increase. Now, if we bring in the breakdown of core and related separately, so you'll notice that the blue line for core engineering remains consistently lower than the orange line for related engineering across the entire period. And the difference is about uh, four to five percent. So what that means is that the roles not traditionally associated with engineering may be more successful in attracting female engineers into the workforce than what may be considered the traditional engineering careers. So now here we have the chart representing the same data, but in terms of actual number of employees rather than the percentages. The color of the lines here represent the same groups as in the previous slide, but um, note there's a double axis here due to the difference in the magnitude between um, engineering and overall, obviously. Um, so the, the axis on the left shows um, the values for the engineering occupations, and on the right for all occupations. So the important thing um, is that the increase in proportion of women represents an increase from uh, 562,000 women in 2010 to 936,000 in 2021, if we're looking at core and related combined. 
um, and that's the grey line there. And this um, has coincided with an overall expansion of the workforce from 5.3 million workers in 2010 to 5.6 million in 2021. So what's also worth noting is that the rise in women continued in absolute terms, even when the total number of engineering roles, roles fell in the first year of the COVID-19 pandemic, and the numbers of women working overall also fell, but we still saw the increase in engineering, which is a positive sign. Now, when we look at core and related engineering in the first half of the decade, we see there's little difference between the numbers of female employees. And actually, in the latter half of the decade, there are more female employees in core engineering, despite there being a lower proportion of women in core than related. So what that's saying is that the size of the workforce in core engineering has seen larger increases over the period, and many of the additional roles have been filled by women. Now, if we look at the data just for 2021, so this chart shows the percentage of women working in different parts of the workforce. The error bars at the end are the 95% confidence intervals, and by that we mean we're 95% confident the true value lies somewhere between those limits. As a reminder, I'll bring in the chart at the top here um, from the beginning to explain the footprint. So first, the core engineering roles. So they're those in the central circle of the footprint. So they're the, they've got the lowest percentage of women at 15.2% of the workforce, compared to 19% in the related engineering occupations. And you'll remember from the diagram that's represented by the outer circle. And if we combine those two, that's where we get the 16.5% that we saw on the previous chart. And obviously we're comparing to the 47.7% of all occupations at the top there. So that's really, you can see from this chart, the significant difference there. Then in this next section, rather than looking at occupations, we're looking at industries. So that's um, everything on the left hand part of the uh, footprint diagram shown in the purple there. So we see here that the sector has higher proportions of women uh, when compared than when we can learn, look at occupations. The 23.9% of um, the engineering sector um, were women. However, that's still low compared to all industries. And then finally, what we look at here is the number of women um, in engineering occupations within engineering industries rather than um, en engineering occupations outside engineering industry. So um, we can see that um, there's many more women working outside of engineering industries, although they're in engineering occupations. We turn now to look at the occupations within the engineering footprint and the different proportions of women working in them. So this table shows the female percentage of the workforce in 2010, 2015, 2019 and 2021. I appreciate there's a lot of numbers here, so I'm just going to um, talk you through them a little bit. So across that time period, culture, media and sports roles consistently had the highest percentage of women working in engineering roles at around two thirds, while skills based roles had the lowest at less than 5%. There's also been significant increases in the percentage of um, female engineers working within other occupational groups during this time. In particular, within the professional and associate professional groups highlighted here, where the figures have increased by between 8 and 15 percentage points. In general, this has coincided with an overall expansion in the number of people working within these SOC major groups, suggesting that new roles are being created in these areas and they're attracting more women into engineering roles. So, for example, between 2010 and 2021, the number of engineering roles within the business, media and public service professionals occupational group increased by 30,000 and the percentage on, of women in these roles doubled. But the picture is complex. There's not really a clear trend across all groups. While we saw an increase in the number of engineering roles at the business and public service associate professional group, <laughs> the proportion who are women decreased from 25.2% in 2010 to 16.9% in 2021. Conversely, despite the increase in overall numbers of engineering roles that are classed as process plant and machine operatives, there's been an increase in the percentage of women in this group from 17.7% to 20.7%. <clears throat> so now if we look at occupations in more detail, starting with those that saw the increases. So encouragingly, 61 of the 97 roles in the footprint saw an increase in the percentage of female workers between 2010 and 2021. And in 19 of these roles, the increases exceeded 10 percentage points. And they were actually quite wide ranging in what they were covering. So, for example, there were rubber process operatives, 
TV, video and audio engineers, um, and electric, electronics and electrical engineers also saw more than 10% increase. In all but um, seven of the 61 roles, in all but seven of the 61 roles, the increase has been in both proportional and absolute terms. So by that, I mean, we've observed an increase in both the percentage and the numbers of women working in them. Um, for 27, it's coincided with an expansion of roles overall in that occupation. So for example, IT and telecommunications professionals, um, the, number of to the total number of roles increased by more than 90,000 overall. And of these new roles, more than half of them were taken up by women. There are also cases, however, where the rise in women has been amidst an overall contraction of the workforce. So, for example, the number of female electronics engineers increased by 2,500, but the number of men decreased by 15,000. So that resulted in an overall decline of around 12,500. Going forward, it's important to understand what's driving the opposing trends. So, um, and whether there are any differences in the way women and men are being treated in terms of recruitment, pay, contract type or retention, for example, across the different areas of the footprint. Now, on the other end of the spectrum, 23 roles have seen a decrease in the proportion of women since 2010. And in nine of these, the change was five percentage points or more. And again, it was quite um, wide ranging. So um, there was inspectors of standards and regulations. There was assemblers, environmental professionals, all of those saw a um, five percentage point or more decrease. Um, for all but five of the 23 roles, it also represented a decrease in absolute terms. So there were actually fewer women working in the occupations in 2021 than there were in 2010. Now, the five exceptions to this are listed here. So these are the ones where the number of women between 2010 and 2021 grew, just simply not at the same rate as men. Um, and finally, for the 13 roles from the footprint listed here, the proportion of women has remained at 0%. So virtually no women are in these professions um, in 2010, and that's remained the case some 11 years later. It's worth noting that for the majority of these roles, the overall size of the workforce has shrunk over the last decade, but still to have no women working them is, in them is a reminder of the large gender gap in engineering. Um, so to summarise, since 2010, we've seen a large rise in the number of women across the majority of engineering roles and across both engineering and non-engineering industries. And this is welcome news. We encourage the engineering community to continue to celebrate and promote examples of women working in engineering roles and the sector, um, especially to the girls who could be tomorrow's engineers so that we can continue to increase diversity. To do this, engineering employers need to understand their own workforce, focus on understanding practices that extend recruitment and retention to underrepresented groups. Um, they need to identify and promote practices that help to increase the appeal, recruitment, retention and progression of women in engineering. And we will continue to research what works in terms of encouraging more girls into engineering and continue to monitor um, what's going on in the workforce so that we can see what progress is being made. That's it from me. Great. Thank you very much indeed, Marie. Uh, very informative.